Welcome, everyone. Um, what's fascinating is that I was just saying how my computer sometimes uh, just cuts off in the middle of um, presentations. And did you know it? It just happened again. So um, apologies. Let's get the show started. Um, so I'm really excited to be introducing um, our 2021 IBHSSS um, seminar series. Uh, here in the Department of Behavioral and Social Sciences. Um, our feature speaker today is Dr. Lisa Bolag from uh, George Washington University. Very excited to have her. Um, since this is our first um, uh, seminar series, I just wanted to say a little bit about this, the series. They're supported by the CV Star Lectureship, and the goals are to promote collaboration, to showcase innovative research, um, and our broad themes are health disparities, community engagement, technology, and um, intervention uh, development. Um, so our committee, um, I co-chair this committee with uh, Prisco Kaler um, and the faculty along with my colleagues, uh, Katie Biello, Suzanne Colby, Nadeva Gee, uh, Jennifer Nazarino, who will be uh, co-hosting with me today as she's our resident expert uh, on intersectionality. Um, and teachers, of course, is very, very well received by our students, um, in addition to Tyler Ray. Um, and our graduate students who um, really were great in terms of giving input on um, speakers as well, Cara De Clemente and Rachel uh, Neely. So, um, you know, since we want to make sure we get to the talk to the guest of honor, uh, Professor Lisa Bole, um, we're very excited to have her today. She's a professor of applied social psychology um, in the Department of Psychological and Brain Sciences at George Washington University, um, and the founding director of the Inter Intersectionality Training Institute at GW. She is a leading scholar of the application of intersectionality to social and behavioral science research, as well as research focused on HIV, HIV prevention and sexuality in Black communities. She has served as principal uh, investigator of four NIH-funded R01 studies including a NIDA-funded fund, uh, R01 to examine intersectional stress, substance use, and co-occurring negative health outcomes among Black men, as well as an NIMH-funded R21 to develop measures of multi-level intersectional stigma for Black, gay, bisexual, and other MSM in Washington, D.C. Um, her findings have been published in journals such as Health Psychology, Archives of Sexual Behavior, and the American Journal of Public Health, where she currently serves as an associate editor. In 2014, Dr. Boleg was awarded a Distinguished Leadership Award from the American Psychological Association's Committee on Psychology and AIDS. And Dr. Boleg interestingly has um, a connection to Brown, um, having worked with the Centers of Behavioral and Preventive Medicine um, at Warren Elbert um, Medical School. And so we're very happy to have her uh, back here today. Uh, Dr. Bolek is a highly sought after speaker, and if some of you are going to APH in next month, um, she will be a featured speaker there. Um, so we thank her for her time here today, and so with excitement and gratitude, Dr. Bolek. Thank you. Wow, what a lovely introduction. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, fantastic. Okay. Well, first, thank you so much for this invitation. I want to thank the IBSHS, it's a long acronym to say, um, seminar series for the invitation. I'm just delighted um, to always talk about intersectionality and I'm just thrilled to be with you. I was saying before we started that I regret that I couldn't be there in person because my first job um, after my doctorate was at the University of Rhode Island in Kingston. And so I have you know, very fond memories of Providence and spent so much time um, on Brown's campus because I lived right like, in the air. I, I lived on Thayer Street for a while. That's a nightmare. We can talk about it another time. Um, but what I'm going to talk to you today about is about intersectionality and why I think it is just so indispensable for behavioral and social science research. Um, I always say when I start talking um, that I've never met a short title that I like. Um, I, and um, 
that's why there's this very long title here. So intersectionality, you know, intersectionality has traveled so much over, over the years. And so where I'm going to begin is just what I call in sort of intersectionality 101 talk to make sure that we're on the same page in terms of how I use intersectionality and what it means to me and its history. Then I'm going to just talk about some of the core tenets of it. Then I'm going to show, um, you know, talk about why I think this critical framework is so important uh, for health science research. And then I'm going to give you just a snapshot of how I'm applying it to two of my current um, NIH funded studies and then I'm just going to leave with some concluding thoughts. So I always start any talk about intersectionality here and here is with Sojourner Truth, enslaved, former um, enslaved woman and she is speaking in 1851 to the Akron Women's Rights Conference in Ohio, so predominantly white um, conference. And she gives this famous speech about a, where this profound refrain of ain't I a woman. And what she's saying is, you know, she, that man over there says that women need to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and have the best place, but nobody ever does that to me and ain't I a woman. And oh yeah, she's clearly a woman. Her issue and what she's pointing out is that her gender, intersects with her race. Those are mutually constituted for her. And you can't understand what it is to be a woman absent its intersection with race for Sojourner Truth. And so we like, and when I say we, I mean intersectionality theorists, like to think of her as sort of the original intersectionality theorist. And it's really important to locate intersectionality here because intersectionality comes out of people's experiences, Black women's experiences, Black feminist experiences. It's, it doesn't come out of the academy. Um, and so it's very important um, to keep this sort of um, activist feminist root of intersectionality. I often show this as also an example of how I think about intersectionality and what I think about when I apply this framework that comes out of Black feminist experiences and activism to my research, my HIV prevention research with Black men. This is the famous um, Memphis Sanitation Workers Strike in 1968. And um, this is the place where um, Dr. Reverend Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr. is assassinated. He is there protesting with them. And they have these signs and they're asserting that that they're men, right? And so what they're protesting is the condition of their, their lives as workers. Um, there have been accidents with um, trash workers, uh, sanitation workers being compacted um, in garbage trucks. They have to work when it's raining. Their white um, co-workers don't have to do so. And they're asserting, I am a man. Yep, oh, they are men, no question there. But their gender, gender is mutually constituted with their race such that you can't understand one absent the other. That's intersectionality. Um, and intersectionality then comes into sort of further being um, with the Kambahi River Collective Statement, this group of Black feminist and Black lesbian feminist who had been meeting. And many see this as sort of the first articulation of intersectionality without using the word. And I think that's really important. People get sort of hung up on, you know, who coined it, where does it come from? But, you know, from 1851 forward, you have people sort of talking about these sort of interlocking systems of oppression. And that's what this statement does. And so we are a collective of Black feminists who have been meeting since 74. Um, and that the statement of our politics is that we're struggling against racial, sexual, heterosexual, and class oppression. And that see as our particular task, the development of an integrated analysis um, practice based upon the fact that the major systems of oppression are interlocking. The synthesis of these oppressions creates the conditions of their lives. There's so much to unpack with the statement. But one of the most important things that I want to highlight is notice how they're talking about interlocking oppression. They're not talking about multiple identities. There's a way that intersectionality is really sort of flattened as it's traveled from its sort of activist roots and through the academy to simply multiple identities. But if you think about it, everybody has a multiple identity. It's really about that sort of connection to power and um, the notion that systems of oppression are interlocking and integrated. 
And then we come to um, the late 80s and we have Kimberly Crenshaw coming in from critical uh, race theory. She's a critical legal scholar. And using this framework, many credit her as the first to, to use the actual term intersectionality, where she shows how the law is applied differently to women of color because they sort of fall through this crack because those inter, the cracks because the intersect their intersections are not acknowledged. She shows in um, one of these uh, key articles this case, this de Graff and Freed um, versus General Motors Assembly. And what's happening in this case is the defendants say that, you know, they're the last people hired, they're the first people fired, and that this is discrimination. Um, but the judge rules against them and says there's no evidence of discrimination because, well, you know, we hire black men. We got all these black men working in the factory. There's no discrimination. We got all these white women working in, the, you know, as secretaries. So there's no discrimination. And so Crenshaw's work shows how women and other groups, women of color and other groups who sort of fall through the cracks of, because they're intersectionally invisible, intersectionally invisible, um, are discriminated against. So this is really sort of what one of the things that intersectionality does. Um, at the same time, uh, you have Patricia Hill Collins, a sociologist, who is writing Black Feminist Thought, this powerhouse book. You won't find intersectionality at that term in this book, but she's articulating the same thing, but from the prism of sociology. And so she uses very much the language of mutual, that these um, different intersectional positions are mutually constituted. Um, this importance of decentering, which is also, it, it's a fundamental um, concept in critical race scholars, in critical race theory, this notion that we need to decenter the perspectives of privileged groups. So in the US, that's historically white, middle class, men, um, heterosexual, able-bodied, um, and that our theories and our, our um, focus should be on trying to understand from the vantage point of groups who have been historically marginalized or oppressed. The other key contribution of um, Patricia Hill Collins is her focus on sort of uh, privilege and penalty and how these ebb and flow. Basically the notion that people aren't marginalized all the time and that power and privilege shape, shift depending on context. And she's been writing up a storm. Uh, these are two of her um, latest books that are just really fantastic. They are uh, they, they take you deep into sort of intersectionality and, inter and, and understanding intersectionality praxis and also understanding intersectionality from a global perspective. So some core tenets, there are many, but when I think about intersectionality and why it's so important for research, um, behavioral and social science research, these are the things that come to mind. One of the things that intersectionality does is rejects this sort of single axis way of thinking in favor of this sort of multiple matrix view. And so as an example, this is how data is mostly, is typically shown to us, right? So this is an article showing from the um, uh, Household Pulse uh, study, um, and they were trying to measure um, mental health in the wake of COVID. And the point here is that there are two groups for whom depression and anxiety um, skyrocketed um, after George Floyd's death. One was uh, Black people, but also um, Asian Americans, which makes sense because, you know, they were getting all the heat with the, so that sort of racist um, business about the, the source of COVID. But my point here is that this is, we, it's single axis in the sense that it's just focused on race and ethnicity. And if you're interested in other intersections, that data is often not presented. For example, if you wanted to understand anxiety and depression for, say, Black women or, you know, or, or Asian American lesbians, that's not here. We're typically just un given um, data through this sort of single axis lens. The other thing that intersectionality rejects is this sort of and or thinking, this is my pet peeve, forever will be, this notion of women and minorities, which is, you know, bandied about all the time. You see it in the media, you hear it is in NIH regarding their guidelines on inclusion of women and minorities. From an intersectionality perspective, this makes no sense. 
because for people like me who are women and minorities, uh, this shows how, how we sort of fall through the cracks because historically, when people think of women, they think of white women. And when they think of minorities, they think of minority men. And so this is sort of intersectionality has, has no patience for this. Um, it also, you know, has problems with this other sort of conjunction, the or. This is an, um, pretty, back in the days when we used to talk about um, health inequities and um, disparities at the federal government level and mean it. Um, this is a 2011 report and so what I'm highlighting here is this report's n notion how that characteristic such as race or ethnicity or gender identity or geographic location from an intersectionality perspective of course there is no or it's it's both and it's all of these things. The other core tenet of intersectionality is that because these intersectional positions, demographics, whatever you want to call them, I mean, you'll, you'll notice that I'm trying real hard not to use the language of identity, um, but that they interlock. And because they interlock, you can't sort of pull out one as the meaningful whole, you can't separate them, you can't rank them. So, you know, a question of, you know, asking people, well, you know, what's the most important identity or, you know, which one is higher, it doesn't really make sense from an intersectionality perspective. That also has implications for measures, right? Because then it means if you're assessing intersectional discrimination, you cannot have a measure on racial discrimination and a measure on gender discrimination and one on um, anti-LGBT discrimination, um, for example. Um, and so I, this is one of my favorite expressions of this. This is um, Janet Mock, who is a transgender, fierce trans transgender um, activist, who just who lays it out here. For me, personally and politically, there's no separating my womanness from my blackness, from my transness, from my meanness. There's just no way you can pull out one of these as a meaningful whole, eclipsing the other, as um, Audre Lorde has written so beautifully. The other core tenet of intersectionality is power. If you're not talking about power, you're not doing intersectionality. You're just talking about multiple identities and all that. That intersectionality is really focused on how people's different social positions are structured differently um, in relation to power and privilege. And here, this is a really fantastic uh, t article in 2013 by um, Sumi Cho, Kimberly Cronshaw, and Leslie McCall. And this article really was a uh, was an attempt to sort of uh, cut through all the madness about, well, you know, who should we be citing? Well, what is intersectionality? What methods should we be using? All of that. And what they write about in this piece is that whatever makes an analysis, what makes an analysis intersectional, whatever terms it uses, is its adoption of an intersectional way of thinking about the problem of sameness and difference and its relations and its relation to power. So they talk about intersectionality as it's like, it's an analytical disposition. It's, it's or Patricia Hill Collins in, um, in much of her contemporary work talks about intersectionality as an analytical, it's an analytic tool. It's not much deeper than that. Um, but it's sort of critical about this notion of power. Oops. And so in my work, um, one of the things that I attempted to do was to sort of push public health, and I've also been doing it in psychology, I'm trained as a social psychologist, um, to embrace intersectionality as a sort of really imp important framework for understanding um, health inequities. Um, the first thing I want to highlight here is that it is a critical theoretical framework. And what we mean by critical is critical theories are a whole bunch of, of different frameworks. Intersectionality is one, critical race theory um, is another, um, that interrogate, expose, and challenge all these sort of taken for granted assumptions um, that function to do several things, right? They function to conceal the role of power. Um, that, you know, um, for example, uh, within um, incarceration, for example, when we talk about mass incarceration, and if we talk about that in a sort of a colorblind way, right, that only certain, you know, you, do, you break the law, you go to jail. Well, there's a way that 
uh, critical theories really expose that and say, well, no, 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 not everybody goes to jail equally. There are structured systems of inequality that are, that are baked in and ensure why, why Black and Latino people in the U.S. are disproportionately represented among the prison population, for example. Um, they also, um, critical theories show how they, um, how these, these thoughts about power relations conceal um, how dominant groups construct knowledge, facts, and problems. I've been um, done some work about um, intersectional um, epistemologies of ignorance, you know, the sort of willful ignorance about structural um, inequality. Um, critical theories sort of blow that away. And also they show how m so many of these assumptions, these sort of taken for granted assumptions about the way things are, are really serve this sort of racialized and economic status quo. So one of the definitions that I um, advance in this article is really based a lot on um, Patricia Hill Collins's notion about micro level and macro level. And so one definition, it's one of many, um, a critical theoretical or analytic framework that says that these multiple demographic or intersectional positions, usually we're talking about, you know, race, gender, sexual identities, gender minority status, and so, so forth, at the micro level of individual experience reflects social structural inter inequality at the macro level. So if you think back to the Sojourner Truth uh, quote that I started with, here is her micro level. She's talking about her experience, right? Ain't I a woman? But what she's really laying out is showing how her individual level experience actually reflects larger systems of inequality for her as a, um, as a former enslaved woman. So I want to jump to why I think intersectionality is so important. One of the things it does is it centers people who are marginalized by structural inequality to ensure that you're highlighting and addressing their specific and particular concerns. And so if you think about how we do um, health policy and health research, so much of the assumptions are premised on white middle class uh, privileged people who have access to health insurance and intersectionality puts this on its head. These are just so big, this is a 1992 article from American psychologists. Most of the subjects were white and middle class, and it was a trends, trends published in research on African Americans. And I show this to you to show that not much has changed. Then there was this 2010 article that you may have um, seen, The Weirdest People in the World, where the authors of this piece uh, lay out that so much of our understanding of sort of behavioral science um, and psychological science is based on people who are weird and weird is westernized. Um, I, the other weird I would add, the other W I would add is white. Um, educated, industrialized, rich, and people from democracies. And this is an example of, these are the groups of people that we historically center. And then we, when people deviate from this in any way, they are considered you know, pathological in some way or, or problematic. And lest you think that, well, you know, that was 1992, that was 2010, that was, um, you know, 10 years ago. This is a February um, article, Febu February this year, in the Atlantic, um, titled The Problem That Psychology Can't Shake. Ten years after a seminal paper laid bare psychology's white affluent Western skew, not much has changed. Why is this important? This is critically important because so many of the theoretical frameworks that come out, uh, that, that we use in our research, come out of psychology. Um, and so the fact that these, this is sort of the people that we center, um, it, it's little, one doesn't have to have a hard time understanding, oh, this is why we're more than, um, you know, 30 years plus in the HIV epidemic and no further in understanding the structural reasons that explain why HIV is disproportionately um, represented in Black U.S. communities still. Um, so apply to my work, I wanted to also show you this because this is typically how 
HIV prevention researchers, th these are the concerns that they center, right? Things like HIV testing and PrEP and condoms and are you aware of, your, of HIV and how to contract it? And if you talk to Black men, as I do in my research, you get a very different understanding when you center their needs and I might and I must add when you use methods that allow them to talk about their experiences and that you're not just asking them well you know how often do you use condoms and how many partners do you have across all of the HIV prevention studies that I've done with black men and most of my research has been with um, black heterosexual men these are the things that they're talking about. When you ask, what's it like to be a black man? They're talking about, men in uh, DC are talking about gentrification. They're talking about incarceration. They're talking about how I've been locked up for something that I did 13, uh, 13, 14 years ago. I have this criminal record for something I did 13, 14 years ago, and I can't get a job. That keeps, that keeps coming back. Um, and then they talk about um, incessantly um, police brutality and police harassment. And then they also talk about this sort of understudied point of, of being, a, how important it is to be a good father. Um, that comes up often in our, in our transcripts. And so what we've done is you, even though all of these studies have been funded for sort of HIV prevention studies, uh, HIV prevention, or to address HIV prevention, what we've done is a different analyses that sort of highlight and try to center their experiences. So this is a paper from 2013. It's an uphill battle every day. And we're trying to understand like, okay, what are the sort of pressures that black men are under as a, as black men and what are the implications of that for HIV prevention. One of our newest papers is the one in the middle um, and what's so interesting about this study for me is that this came from an HIV prevention um, R01 where we were trying to understand black men's risk and protective behaviors from the neighborhood level and so we wanted to you know I mean we know that where you live is sort of one of the best predictors of your health outcome, health outcomes and so we wanted to apply that to HIV and we didn't ask a single question about police um, in this study and this is a mixed method study all of my studies are mixed methods and so we just had focus groups where we asked men we wanted to know about you know would they be tested in their neighborhood but we started with some general questions about what would I see if I came to your neighborhood and over and over they were talking about police harassment. And so what we did, we didn't plan on doing this initially, is we created um, quantitative measures based on their narratives. And that's what this paper is about. Our most recent paper, as in just published online on this week, is one that um, my former um, doctoral student, uh, Sydney Holt, Dr. Sydney Holt, as of August did, where using the focus groups from the menhood study, she looked at all of the sort of stressors that the men talked about with gentrification and trying to understand, again, gentrification as a social structural stressor. Again, this is in an HIV um, study, but this is what you get when you center or you use methods or you use frameworks that center the perspectives of groups who are historically marginalized. So, what else? It prioritizes power and structural context, not just multiple identities. If you get nothing else from what I talk about today, I want you to get this, the importance of focusing on power and social structural context. And when I talk about social structural context, I'm talking about things beyond the level of the individual that shape health and well-being. I'm talking about laws and policies um, and those types of interactions, um, discrimination, structural uh, racism and, and structural intersectional discrimination, as well as interpersonal. All of those factors um, and one of oops. Uh, for this point I always go to the great Greta Bauer who is a colleague and friend of mine and one of the people who I think is doing some of the best work in terms of applying intersectionality to qualitative research with fidelity to core um, concepts of core tenets of intersectionality and what Greta says in this article is that 
focusing on social identities and positions, yeah, you know, that's cute, but we're just focusing on identities without focusing on power and things that we can modify runs the risk of continuing, oh no, not now. Um, folks, it runs the risk of continuing to reinforce the intractability of inequity, albeit in a more detailed or nuanced way. So it, yeah, it is more detailed to, and nuanced to talk about intersecting identities and all of that. But if we're not focusing on, on processes, social processes such as stigma or discrimination that we, can, that we hope to intervene against, then what's the point? Um, said another way, intersectionality is about Praxis. It's really this framework that was that's meant to emancipate, liberate. It's about social justice. It's not just for researching for the sake of doing research. Okay, where is my mouse? Yeah. The other unique thing about intersectionality is its potential to highlight groups and issues that are usually invisible, that just don't come to mind when we think about intersectionality. And so Valley Purdy Vaughan uses this term about intersectional invisibility, and she talks about how people with multiple subordinate identities um, the ones who don't usually come to mind um, because they don't fit the prototypes of their respective groups, they have intersectional invisibility. And one really great example of this is police violence um, and police brutality. If you ask most people about police brutality in the U.S., Black men and boys come to mind, and rightly so, right, because they are disproportionately um, represented um, as victims of um, police violence. Um, but an intersectional position, an, an intersectional framework asks you to figure out, well, what other intersections are there that we need to consider? And so this is an article talking about how Black women are the victims of police violence. Um, trans people, we don't know much about their experiences with police violence. It's a group that's pretty much invisible. We know that they experience high rates of murder, particularly Black trans people, but that's also a group that's intersectionally invisible. And why is this important? It's important if you're designing policies, if you're developing programs, because then it means that you can develop interventions and programs for groups that you can't see, right? Because you're just focusing on the prototypical groups. Another thing that intersectionality does, it's fantastic, is it avoids these sort of additive assumptions in favor of those that highlight what Greta calls intersectional multiplicativity. And this is an article that um, was really, this, this was a really popular article, um, the effect of race and sex on physicians' recommendations for cardiac catheterization um, in 1999. And what they did with the study is they had trained actors, right? And they had everybody follow the same script, um, present with the same the same concerns to physicians. Um, and what they varied, as you can see, is they varied the uh, race and gender of each group. And when they reported the 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 results, what they reported was that patients who were women or black had the fewest number of refer referrals for the, for the procedure. Um, a single axis focus, right? That doesn't take us far. Greta redid the analyses and using an intersection analysis because they had only focused on main effects, sort of, you know, gender or race, and showed that black women were the only group who did not, who had, who were not um, referred or, or were referred for the procedure at far lower rates compared with everybody else. And segue, um, Greta argues that even inter interactions are not intersectional, but it's, she used it um, to show the error of this study. Last point. 
Intersectionality is committed to intersectional praxis. And one example of this, and so, you know, for the longest time in the academy, people, were, well, what is it, what is it? And now people like Kimberly Crenshaw and Patricia Hill Collins are saying, okay, enough. We, we don't need to spend a lot of time talking about what intersectionality is. Let's talk about what it does. And Kimberly Crenshaw is doing this really fantastically in her work with the Say Her Name Project, which is really about a, a program of the African American Policy Forum, which is really about intersectionality in action. And this is what it looks like. The Say Her Name Pro Project, and, if, and I know you've heard about it because this program has, has gotten much more um, popularity and press over the years, sadly so. And say her name, this was the notion that many of us can really sort of, you know, Tamir Rice and Michael Brown, the names of men killed by police just sort of roll off the tongue, but that cisgender, black cisgender um, and transgender women pretty much invisible. And so this is an example of, of what, what I mean when I say intersectionality is praxis. It's sort of this framework that is supposed to be applied with the mission of advancing social justice. So I want to talk a little bit about some of the current um, projects that I'm doing, um, two in particular I'll focus on. These are two HIV prevention projects that I'm working on. And what I'm thrilled about is that my strengths and stressors study actually has intersectionality in, in the name. Um, it gives, gives me great joy. And so this was a study, this was funded in 2019 in, um, by NIDA and um, PRISM, which is funded by um, NIMH. And I'll talk a little bit about these. As you might imagine, we were um, going gangbusters with both of these studies when COVID hit. And so like most of you, we have been just sort of, sort of thrown into the sort of spinner as we modify these studies and try to get them online and so forth. It's, 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 it's been challenging to say the least. So a bit about strength and stressors. I have long been interested in stress, but not just sort of, you know, sort of garden variety stress, but sort of structural stressors, the types of things that men have talked about, talked to us about in our research um, for decades, right? And so the police brutality, the unemployment, all of that type of stuff. And these are just some examples um, of recent stories talking about how Black people in the U.S. were already stressed, and COVID just adds to that. And again, this story about um, Black men fear that masks will invite racial profiling. Again, what do you learn when you center the experiences of groups who are understudied or underrepresented? underrepresented? And so this, we first wanted to understand stress for social structural stressors for black men at different intersectional positions. So I'll show you my team and then I'll show you our conceptual model. So this is my team of fantastic co-investigators, David Shea, who is now at Tulane University, Ana Maria Del Rio Gonzalez, who is at GW, Christopher Cannon of Whitman Walker Health. They are our um, community partner in Washington, DC and Gary Harper at University of Michigan. And so what we wanted to do with this study is we wanted to understand um, drug use, co-occurring um, drug use, and negative mental and physical health for Black men. And we wanted to know it, look at it for Black men at two key intersections. One was sexual identity. And so we're looking at it for Heterose black heterosexual men, gay men, and bisexual men. And we wanted to um, look at it at the intersection of socioeconomic status, sort of higher socioeconomic position and lower. And then we wanted to understand how these, um, it's a longitudinal study, and so we wanted to understand this at two time points. And what we were doing is we were Men would go to Whitman Walker Health. We were collecting um, biomarkers for cardiovascular risk um, disease because there are so many studies that document the link between um, stress and racial discrimination in particular and cardiovascular disease outcomes. And so we were collecting um, blood um, 
a, a lipid panel, um, C-reactive protein, and we were also getting um, urine toxicology to assess um, objective and subject subjective measures of substance use. And then we always want to know in our research, okay, we know about the stress, but what's protective? What's, what's, what's the good stuff? Um, and protective, whether we're talking about social support, resilience, um, and, and for us, we conceptualize uh, resilience very much as Ferguson and Zimmerman do, resilience as a resource, not as a personality trait. Um, religiosity, spirituality, trying to understand what was protective. And then we were going to do, um, focus groups at the end um, to synthesize the qual and quantitative results. And so this was our model. And what I wanted to want, want to point out to you is that you'll see that we have hypothesis based on men at each intersectional position. So the um, orange is the lower socioeconomic status sexual minority men. Um, and then the red is the uh, lower sexual, sexual um, socioeconomic status, heterosexual men and higher, so that rather than our model doesn't have sexual minority over here and, and SES over here, but they're all integrated. Now, this model also highlights one of the great challenges of doing intersectionality research quantitatively, just the logistics. So initially, this is what we wanted. We wanted a sampling frame that would have gay bisexual men, I mean, gay men, bisexual men, and heterosexual men, because gay and, gay and bisexual men are not a monolithic group. These are two distinctly different groups, although they're often collapsed um, in the literature, right? But bisexual men have all sorts of unique challenges that gay men don't, as an example. Black bisexual men face biphobia from mainstream communities, um, mainstream um, heterosexual, heterosexual communities, as well as LGBT uh, communities, for example. But we simply didn't have the resources uh, to sample what would uh, our power analysis show would have been 1,440 men. And so what we did is we collapsed them into, you know, we did what we didn't want to do. Um, and so as you can see with the bottom graph, uh, having a sexual minority ca category got us to 960, which was much more feasible given our resources. I'm thrilled to um, report, however, that um, we wrote an administrative supp supplement that would focus specifically on increasing bisexual men in the study that allow us now to have bisexual men or to recruit bisexual men and look at them at, a dis at their distinct intersectional positions and understand their experiences with stress and what's protective from them, uh, what's protective from them for them. Um, and so we're really excited about this. And so this is an administrative supplement funded by NIDA as part of the Strengths and Stressors uh, study. The next study that we are working on is our R21 that we call PRISM, not original at all, because PRISM was the funding mechanism. And the goal of PRISM is this whole um, request for applications was comes out of NIMH and their interest in intersectional stigma. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. But basically, if you look at black, gay, bisexual men who have sex with men, um, compared with, say, white, gay, bisexual men who have sex with men, that what you find is, um, and this has been well documented in the empirical literature, they report a, engaging in fewer HIV risk behaviors, um, whether it's more condom use, fewer sex partners, less drug use, more disclosure of, the, of their HIV status to sex partners, less protected anal sex, and yet you will find that they are you can see the the first column this year is white um, men who have sex with men shows that they have higher um, awareness of prep that white men were much more likely to discuss statistically more likely to discuss prep with their health advisors and also far more likely to use prep compared with black men who have sex with men, even though, um, even when you control for health insurance status, all of that. And so 
NIMH was really interested in this notion of intersectional stigma, right? Now, one of the problems here is that at, this is an example of how intersectionality can get sort of watered down as it, as it travels. So on the one hand, trust me, I'm very excited that NIH is interested in intersectionality and intersectional stigma. But if you look at the definition here, the, measure, the goals of this initiative are twofold, to advance measurements of intersectional stigma and in parentheses, they define it as multiple stigmatized identities, which of course runs counter every, to everything I've been talking about thus far. But that said, and you'll see here the promoting reductions in intersectional stigma, which is where the um, PRISM acronym comes from, is how this study was funded. And so this study just builds on um, research talking about how um, the guidelines uh, for PrEP let the let black men, black gay and bisexual men fall through the cracks. And this is a study done by one of my colleagues, um, just talks about the role of stigma intersectionally and that it's not just their experiences as gay men, but that intersection with, you know, their experiences of sexual minority status and, and being, and black men. Um, one of the important things that, points that she makes in this paper is that the stigma doesn't reside in in the participants. It's really about these sort of structured interactions um, that make it harder to get prep. And so one of the things we wanted to do, and this is my team, the study is focused in Washington, DC and Jackson, Mississippi. And this is um, Paul Burns and Dr. Leandro Mena from University of Mississippi Medical Center, Tamara Taggart, um, the GW, Anna Maria, again from GW, and Shanika Hull, who is now at Rutgers um, University. And what we wanted to do was understand intersectional stigma sort of spatially and structurally. We didn't want to just focus on all the individual stuff, but we wanted to understand, for example, how do interactions with healthcare providers um, shape HIV prevention for this population, right? Because you don't, you, you can't prescribe PrEP to yourself. That has to come from a healthcare provider. And so we wanted to understand how, what does stigma look like in the community? And we wanted to know at, at, at a sort of granular level, what does it look like when you show up to the physician's office? Are they making eye contact? And so the first part of this was um, is qualitative interviews. And then we want to develop uh, measures, um, quantitative measures. We also wanted to understand what stigma looks like in the community. What does it look like, you know, in terms of what you hear on social media or what you hear from religious institutions? And then structurally. And so we're doing a sort of analysis of um, what are the different laws and policies. So for example, in um, a place like Jackson, Mississippi, that didn't expand Medicaid, trying to understand how that shapes access to HIV prevention. Um, a state like Mississippi that has very few um, anti-discrimination protections for LGBT people, for example, as compared to DC. And so that's um, what we're going to do. And then um, create these measures and then um, assess them. And then again, mix methods, see, integrate them and see what we can learn from the qualitative and quantitative measures. And my last project that I wanted to show you, not it's not uh, HIV specific, is Last year, I decided to charter a new institute at GW, the Intersectionality Training Institute. And the goal of this institute is to, tr to train people who do research, policy, and practice to apply intersectionality to their work, research, policy, and practice with fidelity to core concepts. And so one of the things we had hoped to do this, and this year was, was have a um, in-person intensive in DC where people would come and there would be lots of interactive. I was going to do the qualitative um, part of it. Greta Bauer was going to do the quantitative research part and Olena Hankipsky was going to do the policy part and well you know what happened. So we're sort of in the sort of holding pattern waiting to see if we might be able to meet in person next year. Not looking good um, but I wanted you to um, have the address um, and invite you to send me um, your email address if you want to keep a breath of one of the things we're going to be doing at the institute of the different things we're going to be doing at the institute. So con some concluding thoughts as I wrap up. Things that some takeaways. 
I want you to think, remember, as I said, intersectionality is not just about multiple identities. It's really about structural inequality based on these different intersect, interlocking or intersecting positions. Two, we still need to talk about racism. What I mean by this is that as intersectionality has traveled, there's a, particularly when uh, I've noticed, particularly when um, sexual and gender minority people are the focus, we tend to focus just on sort of heterosexism and not on the fact of, of, of racism and how critical that is to their experiences. And here I, I'm showing you um, Ange Marie Hancock. Um, this is her book. She's a fantastic um, policy scholar on intersectionality. And one of the points she makes in this two, 2007 article is that all intersectional positions are of equal interest. And one of the concerns I have is that as intersectionality travels, and again, everybody has an intersectional identity, there's a way where it seems like people are far more comfortable talking about all of these identities, but not about how central racism is as, as, a, as an omnipresent routine structure that shapes health and well-being for black and other people of color in the US. My second point I'll just I'll jump the second point I was going to make is that critical frameworks they matter. They are so important. This is critical race, critical race theory, picking up on what I was just talking about. The, the central tenet of critical race theory is that racism is not aberrant, it's not anomalous, but it's routine, ordinary, and this fixed fact of life. And it's, so it's really exciting to also see critical race theory sort of being applied to public health. And I should note, intersectionality, comes out of critical race theory. So these things, these, these two frameworks partner really well. And you know you're doing something right in terms of critical theory when you see this level of opposition as we're seeing recently, most recently with the Trump administration who has targeted critical race theory and white privilege and all of the things that, I'm talk that I've talked about in my talk today. And so um, on September 22nd came the executive order on combating race and sex stereotyping where they're basically banning all of these um, institutes that get federal money from talking about the same, the very same things I've been talking about today, structural racism, white privilege. Um, but we need to keep talking about this, obviously. The other concluding point that I want to highlight is that we need to become, we need to focus on developing structural competency. This is a fantastic article um, published in Social Science Medicine. It's, it's targeted to um, medical and sort of clinical practitioners, but it is of such high relevance for researchers who are often trained in these sort of individualistic biomedical frameworks, such as the ones I was trained in as a social psychologist. And it sort of just lays out the ways that we need to start thinking about the role of structure and how they shape different health outcomes of interest and in that we need to develop this sort of um, structural competency I, I see this as a wonderful adjunct with um, intersectionality, that we need to develop an extra clinical language, or I would add extra research language for the role of structure. So many times when we're talking about these multiple identities, what we're really talking is about is intersecting structures of oppression. We need to re-articulate cultural formulations in structural terms. You know, often we, you know, it's the culture, you know, they have a culture of doing this in that community and that explains that. Rather, and look through that at, through the lens of structure. We need to observe and imagine structural interventions. This is one that's near and dear to my heart. Um, many of us know that structural, there's a dire need for structural interventions. Many of us weren't taught but the first thing to do, how to develop a structural intervention, much less um, funding for structural interventions. And we just need to develop a structural humility. Um, so I, I really encourage you to read this article. The last point is that I want to leave you with is the importance of praxis. 
the goal, the ultimate goal of using intersectionality as a prism or framework or analytical tool, whatever you want to call it, is to end inequality. It's not just about documenting it. It's not just about having yet another study showing us what we already know. It really is about praxis. And I will end there and invite your questions. Oh, wait, I've got, I've, I hate that you saw my oh so crowded um, desktop. <laughs> I will end here. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, we're so, um, again, so appreciative of your talk. And you really bring up some really central important points that I think um, here at the School of Public Health, we were really trying to grapple with. Um, and so I do want to, you know, I'm, I, I invite um, everyone um, in the Zoom talk to definitely write your questions. And I just want to start off, if, if that's okay. I, I, I do have this question for you in terms of, I do teach intersectionality, but qualitative, I do a lot of qualitative research, which is, there's a, it, it, where it lends itself to ask those very intersectional questions. But when it comes to quantitative research, um, when people are using secondary data sets, right, where the questions are, already, you know, they're not addressing social position, power relation, social, social historical, historical perspectives. How, how do we circumvent, how do we use an intersectional framework when we're certain colleagues, and, and even myself, I'm currently using a secondary data set on immigrant uh, Filipino workers, um, come at it, how do we bring forth an intersectional framework when the questions are pretty much, um, you know, they're not, they don't, they don't come at it from an intersectionality um, lens. Mm -hmm. My answer to that, there's this wonderful article by Kudras and Utal, um, and it's focused on applying intersectionality to qualitative research. Mm -hmm. But one of the points they make in that, in that article is that just because people can't articulate or don't articulate an inter intersectionality in their, even in their qualitative work, doesn't mean that the analyst is off the hook. So if intersectionality is an analytical, analytic disposition, then the onus is on you, given the data that you're talking about, to in the introduction and the discussion, bring in that intersectional yeah. context for the reader, right? And right. to criticize, you know, I mean, you, you can only work with the data that you have, mm -hmm. but there's mm -hmm. still a way that you can bring that to the data and, and help readers understand, you know, what the sort of blind spots are by using these single axis, the single mm -hmm. axis lens, what we're missing. So we're not off the hook just because the data right. doesn't facilitate um, right. the type of analyses. Right. And I, I, I read in, in your readings, it's like we, we assign meanings to our findings, right? So what are the meanings that we, in the, in a, it's how we assign these type of meanings and like how we use, if we come at it from an intersectional framework, I think that also, even if with the single axis data, we can still have an intersectional paper, a, an article that, right? Yeah, and, yeah. Then I'll, and I'll go one further. I mean, another problem though, is that, you know, so much of the research sort of focuses on these sort of socially constructed uh, variables, like race is one, right? And so that, because the, that's the other criticism to be made that we make in so much of sort of biomedical and health um, research, we make all these conclusions based on race, ethnic, ethnicity, and we don't know anything about the social processes. Yeah. And there's a way that that sort of essentializes and mm -hmm. reifies um, these sort of these biological differences that are pretty much sort of meaning meaningless and so that's the other part um for researchers to not just be oh we find ra racial differences and then you know yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so that's part two of, of yeah. my answer to that okay yeah. great so some questions are coming in so i wanted to go ahead and and, and um ask you them from kate carey uh she um asked can you expand on the comment about interactions not fully capturing intersectionality effects. Do you have suggestions for alternative methodologies? 
Well, I would, I would say um, this is where you need to go to um, Greta Bauer's work. I mean, people are doing interesting things like latent class analysis. Uh, um, I'll say here that I am mostly a qualitative researcher, but the real main point with the interaction piece is that you can't have a gender or whatever, you know, put in your construct ways that is separate from you know, your other variable and then look at an interaction that sort of violates key assumptions, right? And so, and that's what we typically do in interactions. And so that's basically the, the point there. Um, so, you know, in our work, we're using sort of structural equation modeling, but as you will, if, if you look at our, the, the uh, conceptual model that I showed you from the strengths and stressor study, that's sort of one, way to go about it, right? So that you would c construct a group of all of the key intersections that you're interested in and not just looking at, you know, the interaction between sexual minority status and race, for example, but that mm -hmm. each group is its own, each intersectional position is its own variable, if that makes sense. Yes, that makes sense. Um, I don't know if people wanted to go ahead and ask their questions or I can field them if that's Dan, do you want me just to field the well, question? We probably should just field them because there, there are quite a few in the chat. Okay. Um, thanks for a wonderful talk. Catherine Berry says, I would be interested in hearing more about resilience as a resource, not as a personality trait, which, yes, yes, I'd love to hear what you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this, is, this is not original to me. Um, this, uh, you know, Ferguson Zimmerman and their work on um, adolescent resilience really talked about so historically, resil resiliency has been the way we've talked about it, right? And looking mm -hmm. at people who are, who are, you know, who are just, it's, it's a trait, right? Some people are just more resilient than the other. But this framework looks at what are the conditions in the environment necessary to facilitate resilience. And if you think about it, it's, it's really refreshing because then it means that all of us have the potential to be resilient um, in the right circumstances. Um, there's also a paper about, um, by Shaw, oh, I can't remember all the details, I can look it up if, if you need it, where they're talking about, we need to think about resilience in terms of structural terms. Mm -hmm. right? in terms of, and so we did a paper based on one of my HIV prevention studies. These are predominantly low income black men in Philadelphia. and you know, many of them were talking about, you know, all the things that you would think, oh, I keep trying no matter what. I, and there was, you know, in framing that study, I told um, my team, the first author in that study is Michelle Tady. I said, we need to be really sort of careful here because there's a way you run into the risk of sort of blaming people for not um, sort of rising above as if something is wrong with them. In the case of black men, they are formidable structural barriers. Mm -hmm. So you could be resilient all the day long, but if you don't have money, for example, if you live in a neighborhood, um, you know, where the police are, are on you all the time, as and we have countless stories about this, there are all these things that sort of block your ability to be sort of resilient. I mean, in, in my own life, you know, the, the, the news, the, you know, the Breonna Taylor, mm -hmm. um, Ruling this year, um, in these last few days, yeah, I, I consider myself to be really sort of resilient, but this sort of buffeting, mm -hmm. um, this sort of structural injustice just, just sort of wears you down. And so that's what I mean about, you know, what, what are the good things? In, in that study, we tried to understand neighborhood resilience. We wanted to understand, we figured, okay, Money is going to be off the table, right? These are not men who are living in neighborhoods that are going to, you know, with the juice bar and the yoga shops and all that. But what sort of resources mm -hmm. support resilience in a neighborhood? Is it th the example I always use is, you know, is it having that one neighbor who, you know, like in my neighborhood, there's a woman named um, Susan. Susan knows everything. She knows a car that's in the neighborhood that's not supposed to be there. She knows, you know, and there's a way that she looks out for all of us. There's, you know, there's a way that that sort of bolsters, um, that's, a, that's a resilience resource. And so thinking about ways, things beyond the level of the individual that facilitate strength is what I mean when I talk about resilient resources. And we don't 
know really what a lot of those are, um, particularly for black men. I want to say another point about that. Um, in the the strength and stressor study, when we looked at different intersections, one of the things we're really curious about is what does resilience look like for higher SES uh, black men, for example, right? Because there are some studies that show that socioeconomic status is, is not necessarily protective. There you are, you know, partner in your law firm, driving in your nice car, and here come the police pulling you over because of your car, right? And so we're really wanting to understand, you know, what are the sort of uh, benefits and limits of socioeconomic mm -hmm. status as a higher SES as a, a factor of resilience for black men, just FYI. Hence why it's so important to use intersectionality frameworks, right? Um, yeah. And the individualistic, you know, if we keep looking at individualistic traits, then we, then we don't examine structure if we're just constantly looking at individualism, right? And that's what we've constantly been looking, that's how we're trained, that's how I was trained. I didn't learn about um, structural factors, I didn't learn about structural interventions or any of that stuff. And so, you know, we just keep repeating, repeating the, the you know, the, the wheel. It's the same thing, um, individual level stuff, and, 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 we, and we get stuck. Mm -hmm. Hence, we need to go to your institute. We need to be part of your institute and do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so another question uh, from David Z Zalaya. Thank you so much, Dr. Boleg. I really appreciate the reminder of activism and social justice within, within intersectionality research. Similarly, similarly, what recommendations do you have when it comes uh, to intersectionality research within quantitative research when we are limited by measurement, often measuring experiences of discrimination in singular identities and not assessing for structural systems of oppression. It seems that there is still so much work to do related to development and validation. Exactly. And, and so I guess, you know, my, my answer is to do it. It's what we're attempting to do with the um, PRISM study where we're trying to create measures of structure that men could fill, fill out. So for example, in Jackson, Mississippi, for example, are you aware that there are laws that criminalize, criminalize um, HIV exposure, for example, but also it's incumbent upon us. And so I have a really fantastic uh, research team. My doctoral students, um, Rico Boone and Mariam Baba, have been looking at trying to find structural measures of, of stigma and trying to understand becoming conversant in sort of laws and policies. This yeah. also speaks to me for a need for sort of multidisciplinary research, right? So public health people need to collaborate with um, people who, pe law lawyers, for example, attorneys, um, policy people, who sociologists who know more about structure and that these teams need to be more multidisciplinary, um, but we need to seek them out. It's too easy to just say, oh, well, you know, we have this measure for this individual, and let's stay there. Mm -hmm. I, th I think this is an area of growth um, and we can't, and I say, I say the same thing about quantitative research. We can't just say, oh, it's too complicated, so let's not do it. You know, it, it, we need to try and, 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 and publish and build. That's how science advances. It builds um, and it improves upon, um, you know, previous work. That's what scientific advancement is. Yeah, great. All wonderful. Um, I, there's another question too. I want to get to this as well. Thank you uh, from Jacob Van Den Berg. Thank you for the excellent presentation, Dr. Boleg. How do we intervene with healthcare providers who refuse to prescribe PrEP to MSM of color? Yep. Uh huh. So <laughs> I've been talking a lot about this this summer. So NIH, as I told you, is really interested in intersectional stigma and did a series of three different workshops about all of the teams. There were about eight teams um, funded under that intersectional stigma um, request for applications that I showed you. And so one team was on measurement development. That's how we're um, we're funded. Another group is on um, interventions. And then I can't, the third group is really, it's, it's escaping me. Um, but one of the things that I tried to drive home um, every time we met was about, we need to talk to healthcare providers about 
stigma, um, about their stigma. That's where the interventions need to happen. And that gets tricky, right? Because uh, if you ask most healthcare providers about whether they're, you know, they're discriminating other groups, they're like, they're, no, 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 not at all. Um, but I'm very much interested in shifting the focus and when we talk about intersectional stigma in the context of HIV prevention from the individuals to the people who have the power to the people who stigmatize and that's where the training um, from my vantage point needs to happen um, and and so how you how you do that I don't know I um, I know there are people who um, Nelson Vars Diaz did some work in Puerto Rico with um, I think these were medical students where he used, he video, he used videotapes, uh, for example. And I know um, Jose Bauermeister has done some fantastic work where he uses secret shoppers, meaning he will send trained, um, I think these are young, um, young gay bisexual men of color to go and see healthcare and, and they train, trains them to do, um, you know, to interact with healthcare providers and then gives feedback to healthcare providers. I, like, so that's one sort of innovative way, um, but that's where a lot of the work needs to happen. Okay. I and do we can take one, one question and then we probably yeah. have to do the student discussion. Right. There is a, well, actually, this is actually a PhD student. So maybe we'll go ahead and transition to, for, uh, to speak, because I know we're over time right now. Um, but uh, the last question was from a student. So maybe she, we can just ask that question with, this, with the students when we get together with the students. I, again, I don't know if you see the chat, uh, uh, Lisa, but there's countless thank yous and oh. countless praises for you on the chat. I'm going to copy and paste it so I can just send it to you. Thank um, you. We're so grateful for your time and, you know, for the, uh, the faculty and staff that are on the call. I know I, I can speak on behalf of them that we're so grateful for you you know, just really bringing forth the, the, the foundation of intersectionality and really bringing, and then also bringing it, obviously I come from a sociological standpoint, so it's very much integrated in sociology, but just to have your work as a roadmap for, for public health uh, scholarship is just, we're so, I'm, we're so thankful for that. So thank, thank you. you. That's lovely to hear. Thank you. Much appreciated. I, I, I accept. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Hey. So now I do believe we're going to be transferring to speak with the students. Is that correct?